Our lesson this morning is entitled, The Vineyard of the Lord. Uh, we were talking about the vineyard as a relationship of members of the Lord's church to the Lord's kingdom, or His church, and one of them is vineyard. And the only application you can make out of that is, if the Lord's church is a vineyard, then we as workers in that vineyard should be busy working, right? Amen. So, number one, you ask yourself, am I a worker in the vineyard of the Lord? And number two, if I am, am I working in the vineyard for the Lord? So there's the application. But this lesson this morning is going to be four different stories or lessons or parables that Jesus gave regarding the vineyard. And each one has a different lesson, so I want to present those to you, show you what the application was, and of course there will be a secondary application to us as well. But Tim did a great job leading, singing, picking songs that fit this lesson this morning. Uh, for those who are visiting with us, we're glad to have you here. If you're traveling through, we'll pray for a safe journey for you. If you're living in the area and want to worship here, uh, we'd be glad to talk to you and discuss that with you. And we'd love to have you worship with us. Let's go back, if you don't mind, to Matthew chapter 20. That's the first one we find. Most of them will be in Matthew 20 and 21. And they're rather obvious, transparent stories that Jesus tells. But the first one is the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, is like a landowner and his vineyard. And it begins in verse 1 and says, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. You see the connection? Laborers and vineyard, what else would you do there? Early in the morning he hires laborers. It goes on to say when he had agreed with the laborers for how much? A denarius a day. That was a day's wage in that day and age, and so that's a fair price. He sent them into his vineyard. But now notice this. He said he went out about the third hour of the day and hired more laborers for the same pay. Then he went out about the sixth hour of the day and hired more workers again for the same pay. And then about the ninth hour of the day, late in the day, he hires even more workers for the same pay. And at the eleventh hour, yet he hires more workers for the same pay. Do you see a problem with that? Well, you would if you were one of the workers who were hired early in the morning. They're all receiving the same wage regardless of what time they were hired. Now you just imagine yourself, don't think about Jesus telling this story, just imagine if you went to work somewhere and that happened to you. You worked from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and they gave you $10. And a guy works from 5 to 6 p.m. and he gets $10. You'd say, no, wait a minute, that's not fair. That's not, that's not right. And that's exactly what these vineyard workers said. They came to the master and said, well, that's not fair. You gave us the same pay you gave these people. And Jesus is the vineyard owner, and he makes a story. And the first one is, the landowner can do as he pleases with his own possessions. Look down at verse 15. He says, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? It's my vineyard. It's my desire to hire people. I can pay them what I want. Will we all agree with that? The answer is yes. Somebody says, yeah, but these other guys got cheated. Well, let's see what it says about that. His next question was, is it wrong for me to be good? The Greek word agathos, which in this context means to be kind to medevil. So he's being kind to the laborers who came later, is he not? By giving them the equal pay that he gave those who worked all day long. And so he said, can't I be kind to benevolent if I want to? It's my vineyard, it's my money. I hired them for so much, they agreed to work for so much. Can I not do that? And the answer is yes, you can do that because it's yours. And what we need to remember in the application is the Lord's vineyard today is his church. And we need to remember that he's the one who is the divine monarch. He's the supreme owner of the vineyard. He can do with his church as he pleases our job as workers is to say, Lord, speak, I'll obey. I'll follow the instructions. We may not all always think it's fair or right, but we've got yet another point about that. 
So he makes an application in verse 16, says, So the last will be first and the first last, for many are called, but few are chosen. We still got that one nagging issue about these guys that seem to be jilted because they worked all day long for the same pay. But then if you notice, it says in verse 10, when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. And they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, these last men of both worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. Now here's the solution to this problem. He answered one of them and said, Friend, am I I'm doing you no wrong? Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. No renewing of the contract here, folks. In the sports world, there'll be athletes who'll get paid millions of dollars to play, and then a year or two later, somebody comes along and gets twice what he got. And so the player sits out and says, I'm going to renegotiate my contract because I'm worth every bit as much as this fellow over here. And that's the same analogy we see here in this chapter. Jesus is telling this story. And the point was, when you give your word and you promise to work a day for a denarius, that's what you're going to get. You don't deserve more. You don't deserve less. You agreed to it. Therefore, you got what you agreed to. But I don't think that's the overriding story or lesson of this story. The real one that we need to get is this point here. The last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. Do you know why those other workers came later in the day? Because they were looking for work, but nobody hired them. They were willing, but nobody had invited them to work in their vineyard. What's the application for us? Salvation is a gift from God and nobody earns their salvation. So if I obeyed the gospel when I was 13 years old and became a faithful Christian till I died at 80 and another person obeys the gospel at 60 and serves the Lord until he dies at 80, do you think I deserve more than him because I worked more years than he did? No, because it's a gift from God. Neither one of us can earn our salvation and we need to keep that in mind. Jesus is the chief landowner. We are his servants and we'll always be his servants. We'll always be in that relationship. And therefore, in this parable, we need to keep in mind who is who. Great lesson that Jesus taught. And there's a reason for that because some of these workers in the vineyard of ancient Israel had decided that they were the ones who were going to make the decisions for the vineyard and not the Lord himself. Some today in the church decide they know more about how to run the Lord's church than he does, and so they take it upon themselves to tell the landowner how to operate. So we don't want to do that, do we? Well, look at number two, the scripture reading we had this morning, chapter 21, verses 28 through 32. And again, Jesus tells the story, and he says, What do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. He came to the second son and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He said, Yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. You ever have children like that? Or employees like that? said, a man who hires a slothful man to work in his field is like a man who has smoke burning his eyes. It's irritating. So the question is, which of these two sons did the will of his father? And this is not a difficult parable or analogy to interpret. The Pharisees and the self-righteous Jews who thought they owned the Lord's vineyard were the ones who said, Lord, I go to work in your vineyard, but they're not doing his will. In vain they worship God, teaching for doctrines, commandments of men. In vain they have made null and void by their traditions the commandments of God. But they said, oh, we're going. We're doing your will. But they're not doing anything that God, that God commanded whatsoever. 
On the other hand, the second son would be those who have been rejected. In this analogy, he says, it's like those who are tax collectors and harlots. Well, you can't get any lower on the social ladder than that. Tax collectors were outcasts to the Jews. Harlots were despised, looked down upon. They're wicked, they're immoral, they're no good, they're worthless. But Jesus Christ makes the application, says in reality, these are the ones who said, I will not work in your vineyard, but afterward upon reconsideration, they repented and went. And so his application is this. I surely I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but tax collectors and harlots believed him and when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe also. They passed up the opportunity twice. And so the point is, is this. Tax collectors and harlots will enter the kingdom of God not because they're tax collectors and harlots. We haven't lowered the moral standard. But because these people living in sin and realizing the despicable nature of sin and how that it only destroys changed their mind and saw the opportunity to repent of that lifestyle, be washed and forgiven in the grace of God, and become a righteous citizen or a good worker in the vineyard again. What a privilege it is that God is the God of the second chance. So if there's anyone here today who needs to obey the gospel by faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, look at this analogy or this story and see yourself in it. Well, I'm not a tax collector or a harlot. No, maybe not. But we're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. We all need forgiveness. We all need help. Right? Shake or nod, wink or blink. You know, we're here. Okay. Well, why? Well, they repented and obeyed. The Jews stubbornly refused to obey the first invitation. John the Baptist came in the way of righteousness. He was there to prepare the path for Jesus Christ. He said, I am not the bridegroom, I'm the friend of the bridegroom. But when the bridegroom comes, then my joy is fulfilled. There's the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, but they rejected him. Didn't want that Messiah, but the tax collectors and harlots believed and thronged to Jesus Christ, so much so that all the nation of Israel was following after Jesus, and the religious leaders thought, if we don't kill this man, then we're going to lose our place in the kingdom. That's all they worried about is themselves. But still yet, when they saw these people coming to the Lord, they still did not trust and obey God. And that's lesson number two. Whether you consider yourself a righteous spiritual leader or a tax collector or a harlot or something in between, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith and if you need to repent, then repent and obey Jesus Christ. Past moral character can be forgiven. And Jesus Christ is the Savior of everyone who believes and comes to him. You can't find a better opportunity than that. After he rose from the grave, his first commandment to his vineyard workers was, go make disciples of what? All nations. Go preach the gospel to every creature. I remember a story that Marshall Keeble, a black gospel preacher from years past when there was a lot of you know, we think it's kind of bad today that we have this kind of moral stigma or prejudice against races. But even more so, someone questioned his salvation because he was a black man. He said, in his answer, I loved his answer. His answer was, well, the Bible says, preach the gospel to every creature. He said, I'm a creature, therefore I belong to the kingdom. And amen to that. And I'm glad those days were past. But you see, that's the point. The Jews didn't think the Gentiles belonged either. He said, preach the gospel to every creature. If they will repent of their sins and believe and obey me, they can be a child of God in the kingdom. They can be a worker in the vineyard. They can reap and harvest great opportunities for God. So that's lesson number two. Now let's turn to chapter 21, verses 33 and following. This is a little more lengthy, but I think we still see the, the opportunity and the application pretty easily. In Matthew 21, 33, beginning, Jesus says, well, here's another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard, set a hedge around it, 
dug a wine press in it, and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Jewish people who lived in the land of Israel at that time, which was a land when it was inherited by Israel, it was a land flowing with milk and honey. It was a very fertile land. It was very rich in soil. Grapes grew in multitudes in those vineyards in Israel. Not like you see over there today. It was far richer than that. Isaiah chapter 5, as well as other passages in the Old Testament, made the analogy that the Lord's vineyard was Israel. So when Jesus talks about this story of a landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it and dug a wine press and built a tower and leased it to vine dressers, they knew exactly what he was talking about. God created Israel as his vineyard. And as he went back to heaven or remained in heaven, he leased it out to the religious leaders of Israel. And then what happens to it? Well, it says he went to a far country. When vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. These servants would be the prophets of the Old Testament. In Israel's rebellion, God sent prophets to them early and late to try and get these people to do what was right. What did they do to the prophets? They beat one, they stoned another, and they killed another. So you see the obvious analogy. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come and let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. And again, this is a prophecy of the Messiah of Jesus Christ himself. But the question is, what do you think the landowner will do with those miserable, wicked workers? And the people listening to the story knew the answer. He said, well, they will destroy that miserable, those miserable workers. And destroying them he will lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits of their seasons. But when you take the aggregate of these wicked men, as Jesus calls them in this parable, he's talking about the nation of Israel. They're the ones that killed the servants sent to them. They're the ones that killed Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And by their own admission, God now is going to destroy wicked, miserable Israel and lend it out to another spiritual nation, the kingdom of God, the church of Christ, who will render the fruit to its owner in its season. And it's interesting as you read the different accounts. For example, in uh, Luke chapter 20, an analogy or the parallel there, the Jewish reply in verse 16, when they saw the application, the Jewish leader said, certainly not. God's not going to take that kingdom away from us. But you notice what Jesus said to them? And we see it here. When they tried to reject that, Jesus said to them in verse 42 of Matthew 21, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Yes, it's an amazing thing. It's an unbelievable story. But it's absolutely true. And Jesus quotes Psalm 118 and applies it to them and says, I am the chief cornerstone that has been rejected by you builders. What did you think that passage was talking about? Well, that kind of zung them right between the eyes. And what makes that more impressive is go back to chapter 21. And this is Jesus triumphal entering Jerusalem. And when he comes into the city... They say, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Guess where that statement comes from? Psalm 118, verse 26. So that passage, that psalm was fresh in their minds because they had just welcomed the Messiah into the city. And Jesus, while there, tells this story about these miserable workers who have taken everything the landowner had and killed and destroyed it. And the application that Jesus made is found in the same Psalm 118, 
verses 22 and 23. God couldn't have orchestrated it better to let them know, you people deserve to be destroyed and the kingdom taken from you. So I said, well, I'm glad I'm not in that kingdom. Well, time out. We're not done yet. If the kingdom of God will be taken from Jews and given to a nation, it's a nation doing what? Bearing the fruit of it. The new spiritual Israel is us. Romans chapter 2, 28 and 9 says, He's not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Those days are gone because the Jewish nation lost that privilege. But today he is a Jew who is one how? Inwardly. Circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men but from God. So for us in this new spiritual vineyard, Jesus Christ is the landowner, and if we're doing our job as workers in the vineyard, then we obey the gospel from the heart. We remain faithful, tireless workers in the vineyard until he comes that he might receive the fruit of his vineyard. That's fair, isn't it? So again, we're back to the question, are you a worker in the vineyard? If you're a member of the Lord's church, you are. Are you working as you should in the Lord's vineyard? Are you doing the same thing those wicked Jews did back in Jesus' day? And I hope the answer to that is certainly not. So one lesson we learn from this is that no one has the right to take what belongs to someone else and appropriate, appropriate it to themselves as though it were theirs. We understand that. It's called stealing. But more importantly, as Jesus said in Matthew 22, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Let's be sure we're faithful workers in the kingdom and faithful citizens of the United States of America. So that's our responsibility because we have those relationships to do. All right, the fourth time Jesus uses the analogy of the story of the vineyard is Luke chapter 13. So if you're following along, turn over there and listen carefully, verses 6 through 9. And again, another short parable, but these are all by Jesus. It said he also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his what? Vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that you can cut it down. Well, we're back to the same point, aren't we? For three years, nothing was on that fig tree. The owner says, cut it down. The thing is not bearing fruit. Let's get rid of it. And the one who was fertilizing and taking care of it, the keeper said, let it alone. Let me fertilize it. Dig around it. See if we can get any life out of it at all. And if not, then you can cut it down. And again, the application is rather apparent. God's giving us a second chance to serve in his kingdom. Be sure that we're busy working in his vineyard. If we're not bringing fruit for the Lord, then we're being a fruitless child of God, and that doesn't last long. So the lesson is, bear fruit as a child of God or be fearful of being cut off by the Lord. That's the application of Jesus in John 15, 1 through 6. So turn over to John 15 and see that lesson. Jesus said, every branch in me that bears fruit is blessed, but it's also pruned that it may bring forth more fruit. So a child of God who's being faithful Lord and who's strong in the faith, when he goes through trials and tribulations and periods of suffering and difficulty, just view that as pruning. It hurts, but it always makes you stronger when you come out the other side, right? I mean, imagine you being the tree or the vine and you're having your limbs cut off. That wouldn't feel good, would it? But you always cut off the dead wood so that the rest of it can be made more fruitful. That's Jesus' analogy. Secondly, every branch in Jesus that does not bear fruit is taken away and thrown the fire to be burned. So the point is, God doesn't endure people who just sit there and sit. We have to get up and get. Number three, he says in verses four and five and seven, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you shall bear fruit for without me you can do nothing. But abiding in Jesus means to abide in his words. 
So the Lord's vineyard, the Lord's kingdom, the Lord's church must have book, chapter, and verse for all that we say and do because we don't want to become miserable, wicked workers who do what we please. And again, he says in John 9 through 11, whoever transgresses does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine has both the Father and the Son. But if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor bid him Godspeed. For he who bids him Godspeed is partaker with him in his what? Evil deeds. Or as Revelation 22, 18 and 19 says, Whoever takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take his name out of the book of life, and from the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. God takes his authority seriously, and we saw that in one of the stories this morning. Christ is the landowner. We have no right to be trying to tell him how to run his vineyard. And so we have to abide in Jesus, because apart from him, we can do nothing. When we teach human doctrine, or human schemes, or human wisdom, or human, human thinks so, because we think we can improve upon the Lord's plan, then we're outside of Jesus Christ and in grave danger. Well, that's the lesson for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I enjoyed preparing the lesson because as we were studying this uh, workbook in our Bible class, in the adult class, I realized I don't think I've ever preached a lesson on the Lord's church being the vineyard. There's many good lessons there. And Lord willing, in another week or so, there's a second lesson coming from this, and we'll do that at that time. But this morning, four stories of Jesus tell, about, tell us about his kingdom of vineyard. The first lesson was salvation is by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. Salvation is always a gift of God, but it's not an unconditional gift. You have to believe and obey. Which is the second lesson. Obedient faith says, not one that just says and does not do. Son, go work today in my vineyard. I sure will, but he didn't go. Did he obey his father's command? No. Lesson number three, the vineyard or kingdom is given to those who love God and do his will. And isn't that the way it should be? He is not a Jew who is not one outwardly. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, who obeys God from the heart, who loves God with all of the heart, soul, mind, and strength, and he brings forth the Lord's fruit in his proper times. Is that you? Do you love the Lord? Have you obeyed from the heart? Are you a Jew from the inside out, spiritually speaking? And lesson number four, produce fruit or be cut off. These are all solemn lessons, and yet every one of them were applicable to the people to whom Jesus spoke in his day and time. The sad thing was most of Israel rejected Jesus Christ, crucified him, and then on the day of Pentecost, still turned their back on Jesus. But 3,000 souls changed their mind, repented and came back, and decided to be the kind of people that God wanted them to be. If this morning you see the lesson, you need to make public confession of public sin. No better time to do that than now. And simply say, I want to be a humble servant in the Lord's vineyard. I want to help my life to be a fruitful production for Jesus Christ. If my life is spent serving Jesus and bringing forth fruit to his glory, then my life has been well spent. If I live for myself and all I have done is honored myself, then I have lost everything I live for. This morning I want you to go to heaven, serving God and hearing him say one day, well done, good and faithful servant. Servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord prepared for you from the foundation of the earth. It's your choice, and you get to make the decision while we stand and sing this morning.